All this is Dr. Yeah. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So we have the regular rock star now. So I think we're going to start giving badges to those who are our regular rock stars. So we have Dr. Daryl Damello with us once more. He is practicing in, the, in India, has been super helpful for the COVID patients and to manage them. In addition to the therapeutics that we have been discussing with him, today we wanted to discuss non-therapeutic aspects of COVID management. For example, what is the role of nutrition? What is the role of uh, staying alert on day seven or eight? What happens in those days? And then we also have a patient here as well who would discuss their experience with us. So with this, first of all, let's welcome Dr. Demello, and then we'll start the discussion. So Daryl, welcome. Good morning, Dr. Mobin. It's an uh, absolute delight coming to you again for the fourth time. I think we have become really good friends now, and I think all the cool beans will enjoy what I'm going to say next as we go along. I come, I'm now coming live from my hometown, which is Goa, the beautiful uh, seaside resort town in Goa uh, or in India. And I'm coming live from there. I am in a hotel room, so forgive me for anything that goes odd here. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the way it is. So I do come live to you from Goa. Excellent. So welcome from welcome from Goa. So here, uh, let's start our discussion. So today we wanted to go over the non-therapeutic aspects, critical and important for the COVID management and, and surviving COVID correctly. So tell me this, should we quickly look at the stats for the world and for India and just to see where the pandemic stats, stands or has it become an endemic and is it going to go down and become nothing very soon? I hope so. So I'm going to share my screen. And I want to have your uh, comments about where we stand. So this is India's worldometer. Number of test, uh, number of new cases have gone down to 23,000, 23, 28. Uh, at one point in May, for example, 382,000. So what are your comments about this? Uh, as far as we are concerned, and as far as I'm concerned in particular, and I've said this for the last three months, I've been saying this, we will, we will not have a wave three. If we have a wave three, it'll be like the small waves on the beach. When I go to the beach here in Goa, you get the one big wave and then you get some small ripples that come along. That's what we're going to have as we go along. So from my perspective, I think we're done with COVID. And I'm beginning to focus on wellness and you know, health, health programs for people and all kinds of different things, then focusing on COVID. Yes, I do treat COVID. I did get, what, four new patients today, uh, plus another three uh, post-COVID patients. Uh, so it, it varies between two to four, two to five case, new cases a day for me. But on the whole, the numbers have come down pretty dramatically. I think we'll stay in that 20 plus range uh, as we go along, we've had a very successful post Ganesha Chaturthi festival uh, without major case bumps. I also expect the Durga Puja or Dasra festival, which will happen on the 15th, to also kind of a go without any ripples. And then Diwali, of course, is our next big one. So I think India is done. And India is done probably because we do have a couple of things. One is we have a lot of immunity. Uh, natural immunity derived from natural infection. So what you, you and I would have called herd immunity. We're not yet there at herd immunity, but with the vaccination now at pretty significant numbers, I'm told we have like 840 million people already vaccinated, uh, uh, at least one, one dose. And something like 300 million people have got two doses. So we do have a large amount of people who have had the vaccine and a very large amount of people who've had the uh, disease. So from my perspective, if you want a prediction, I think India is pretty much done with COVID. We can start looking at, and governments, state governments have started looking at getting back to work and getting back to things and opening up. And it's pretty easy when you go and see on the beach and go to places, hotels are full, people are moving around. So life is pretty good now. Excellent. Excellent. Uh -huh. I love it. And it is actually interesting for me to hear this. And number one, congratulations. And number two, it was interesting to hear this because yesterday when I was looking at the Molly Piravir from uh, Merck and some of the folks, 
wrote a comment that why did I say hospitalization or death? That is how they reported it. So I could not convert that into and death. They had said in their studies title that it re reduces hospitalizations or death, and that is how I reported it. Anyways, one thing that I, uh, Daryl, I saw yesterday was that Merck had said that because of the humanitarian crisis going on in India, because of COVID, they implied sort of uncontrolled COVID. And they said it is really important for malnupiravir to start getting used in India. The, the numbers that I'm seeing and the way uh, you just mentioned it, I don't think that there is a need at this time to say the whole country should start using any medicine. I mean, I'm not talking about malnupiravir in general. But when I was reading that, I thought, huh, I think that we are getting out of uh, COVID. So you seem to be on the same page. Yeah. And I, I second that because I'm the one on the front line here. And I think we are pretty much done with done with COVID from that perspective. I made a prediction the last time I was with you, and I've been making a prediction for some time about some of the Western countries. I think you'll see the U.S. starting to fall in cases from the middle of October. The cases have started coming down, uh, but not that significantly still. I think we will start seeing number of cases come down, number of deaths come down. And again, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think by 15 of November, we'll, your wave three or wave four or whatever wave you have in the US will be over. And I think people can get back to work pretty openly because once there's a certain level of uh, infection and immunity in the population, you don't need anything else. So we are definitely looking at things going down. So I don't think that's an issue. And it's Excellent. it's just just making making it's making life pretty easy for everyone in the world, you know. Excellent. And for the U.S., again, my commentary here is, uh, and I mentioned this before as well. Number one, a significant number of population has been vaccinated. Number two, the remaining uh, population has those people who were infected and recovered. I do not know how many of them are vaccinated as well. So where is the how much is the overlap? And then there are healthier individuals, there are children as well. So generally, it seems like U.S. is on the way out of this issue as well. This probably would, the nuisance would continue. There is one more uh, aspect, and that is the, the uh, virus itself becoming more and more adapted to humans. It is eventually going to end up being a humanized virus that is just sitting around or would disappear and not bother us more. Yes, at this time, it has been deadly, but that is viruses uh, end result as well, not just humans. So good news. Thank you very much. And I hope it comes true. These are the kind of news is that we pray as well that they come true when we are out of this COVID. So with this, I, I'm going to say something about the Delta virus. I think the Delta virus is the last variant that we need to worry about. I don't think we'll need to worry about any of the other ones. I think Delta has taken over the uh, the main main mantle and uh, in the history of virology if you, anybody knows virology 101 i'm going to talk about when you have viruses that mutate they get less potent less lethal le they get weaker so they're unable to really kill the population it'll become it'll become like a it could become like a, a annual event or two two yearly event for those who've not had the infection but for those of us who've had this infection, I'm going to go out again on the limb and say this is a minimum five-year immunity, maybe as long as 20 years. I'm looking at SARS, and this is a coronavirus. So for me, I'm going to err on that side of the fence rather than on the side of the fence of being a flu virus. I've been this has been my my, my pitch, my thoughts, my my views from day one when we came across uh, COVID. Obi. And, and to support your point here, SARS-CoV-1 study, I always mentioned it. There are a couple of studies that were done on SARS-CoV-1 for its long-term protection. And they saw that mm -hmm. antibodies against SARS-CoV-1, I'm not talking to one, they continued for two years and then they reduced in the third year. Now, two years mm -hmm. protection is actually sufficient protection to just remove the virus from the population because... It won't find more people to go to. And secondly, right. the T-cell-based immunity, 
was detected even after 10 years. And there is a study that is done on SARS-CoV-2 that I discussed here, which made some people very upset that why am I saying that natural immunity is also very protective. Uh, in that study, they had said that those people who had natural infection, and I would suspect that would happen with vaccine as well, that the plasma blast, the memory B cells, ended up in bone marrow as well, where they can live on for decades. So that means if we are fortunate, if these sciences and data is correct, then we would have better immunity and COVID would have to go away. So uh, right. thank you very much for this. And uh, Doug is saying that F Facebook stopped. Yes, so somehow, uh, I think because of the Facebook platform issues, Facebook um, fa Facebook uh, relay is, my software is showing me that they're not able to relay on the Facebook. So my apologies for that. Okay, uh, continuing with our discussion, Daryl, should we now switch from where we are in the world towards the non-therapeutics for COVID management? We, we've talked about the medicines, what medication we use. We've talked about timelines. We've talked about a lot of things uh, in the past three uh, things. I'm not going to go over that. Let's talk about what are the other non-medical situations we, uh, parts of the protocol that, that I apply, and we'll go from, we'll start with that. Uh, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So, so in the non non medical aspects of treatment for COVID, in my protocol, uh, I ask a question: Why do patients clot at night? And and I, you know, some other possible reason. I'm going to ask Dr. Mobin. Mobin, you want to go talk about that that paper we talked about about the circadian rhythm. Uh, that you and I have talked about at length. Uh, you want to bring that up and uh, talk about that first? Absolutely. So let me give a quick um, structure to the uh, discussion for the cool beans. Cool beans, what we are going to do is this. The basic discussion is that clotting has a greater propensity to occur at night. And Dr. Uh, DeMello has shared a paper that I'm going to just very quickly show the summary to you to prove this point that at night there is more tendency for clotting during the day there is less tendency and then dr demello would take it from there so here is the paper i wish i had done this paper justice to do a separate talk about it because it is a fascinating paper paper is this uh, the circadian rhythm of selected parameters of the hemostasis system in healthy people Circadian rhythm are the normal rhythmic changes in our chemical substances and the cell counts and our bodies changes between day and night. So various part in 24 hours, they change. So that is circadian rhythm. And this particular paper is about thrombosis or hemostasis or blood clotting. So what they are doing is they're talking about clotting tendency increasing and reducing every day in all of us. And then uh, Daryl can talk about how that relates to COVID. So I'm going to give you a very quick view of various parts of this paper and then show you a summary. So if you see here, they have done a lots of analysis. There were 66 healthy patients, not patients, people who were participating in it. They collected their blood at 8 a.m., 8 in the morning, at 2 in the morning, then 8 in the morning, then 2 in the evening, and then 8 in the evening. And they looked at various substances, clotting related substances and their concentrations. And here is what they found. I'll give you the summary first. What they found was there is a greater tendency to clot during the nights. So let me explain now very quickly. First thing that they did was they looked at melatonin. If you look at this chart over here that I have, this is 8 a.m. morning. And this is 2 p.m noon afternoon then this is 8 p.m night and then this is 2 a.m as well why i kept it this way because they presented their charts in the same way so it would be useful for you to see it in the same way so if you read it you can connect it first thing that they did was they looked at the melatonin levels and this is important just if you look at this line they are showing that melatonin is the greatest in the morning at 2 a.m and then it was the least at 2 p.m what did that prove what that proved is 
that all the people who were taking part in, in this study, they had the correct circadian rhythm. Their melatonin should be high in the evening, in the night, and it was, and it should be low in the day because it should be alert, alert and less sleepy, and it was. So this proved that these folks were healthy and they had the correct circadian rhythm going. Now, let's look at what they showed in terms of uh, clotting. They showed that number one, prothrombin time. So if you see here, prothrombin time is an indicator for the clotting. The longer this time, imagine it is a clotting time. You prick on a, on a finger and you see how long does it take to clot. So of course, if it takes longer to clot, that means less tendency to clot. And if it takes short period of clotting, that means higher tendency. So what this saw was that at 2 p.m., the clotting tendency was low and at, at the um, morning, the clotting tendency was high. I drew it the other way around, so my apologies. It should have been this way, this way. So clotting tendency was different. Actually, let me back up. It was correct. In the morning, clotting time was short. That means clotting occurred very fast. Faster. And in the, in the evening, the clotting occurred slowly. This is very important. That means during the morning or night time, our clotting increases. Tendency to clot increases. Next, this is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is the product with the clotting. So once again, if you see here, in the morning, fibrinogen is high. In the evening, fibrinogen is low. What does that mean? Fibrinogen, see these red threads on the platelets? Platelets are the ones that are making clots inside the blood vessels. These, we, we tie those platelets together with these red threads. I've done this discussion in detail once in the past. So these red threads are fibrin. So if you see here, in the morning, fibrin is more. In the evening, fibrin is less. Why? Because in the morning, the clotting tendency was more. And in the evening, the tendency is reducing. Next is the platelet count. Platelet are the ones that make the initial clot. So if you see here, again, in the morning, platelet count is high. In the evening, platelet count is low. High platelet count means platelet have become activated and they are marching to the areas of clotting and they're going to clot. They are going to take part in this clot. And they are coming out of their stores in lungs and in spleen and in, from the side of the blood vessels. And now they're active in the circulation so they can become aggregated and clot. So in the morning, more platelet is a bad thing for a healthy individual. Now, for healthy individuals, this bad thing is not too important. This is normal circadian rhythm. It is fine. But for a patient, this would become an issue when they have more platelet counts in the morning and clotting tendency would occur. Then is the platelet aggregation. So if you see this line here, platelet aggregation, they saw that 8 a.m. in the morning, platelets started aggregating more. They found more markers for the aggregation of the platelets. And in the evening, they found less. So imagine in your mind, if you will, in the morning, from 2, 2 a.m. in the morning to 8 a.m. in the morning, platelets are coming together and hugging each other. You are sleeping as well, and they're sleeping and hugging, and they're being tied together with fibrinogen, and they are made into small clots. And then... As the morning starts going away, platelets wake up as well, and now they are untied from each other. The fibers are cut down, fibrinogen is separated, the ropes are released, and now they are just moving around and they'll go in a store with spleen or lungs or blood vessels and they just go away. That is what's happening. So here the count is increased. Increased count in the morning means more aggregation. Then if you see here TPA, so tissue plasminogen activator, the function of TPA. In my previous discussion, cool beans know that I always make TPA like a scissors. The function of the scissors, TPA, is to cut these red ropes around the aggregates of the platelet to release them and free them up and break the clots. So if in the morning TPA levels start increasing, that means now the clots are there which we need to start, you know, cutting them and hemolyzing them. So TPA levels go 
in a change as well according to the clotting and finally is the d-dimer so what do you expect would happen with d-dimer we have become so used to talking about d-dimer with covid in the morning platelets are now aggregating with each other by the evening those clots have become diluted or or resorbed as we say and fibrinogen will be broken down the, these ropes will be released and the smaller pieces of the ropes are called D-dimers. So D-dimer would start increasing from the morning towards the evening. So by the time evening rolls around, the platelet count is reduced because platelet has gone to their storage. D-dimer levels have reduced. TPA is increased because T TPA was doing its function. And then this rhythm would start again at night. So conclusion is in the evenings, and I'm going to show you the conclusion here from their paper. The conclusion is, in the morning time, somewhere about 2 o'clock in the morning, if you see here, somewhere about 2 o'clock in the morning, we have a greater tendency to start clotting. And as the after 8 a.m. rolls around, those clot would start diluting and dissolving. And by the evening, they have disappeared. And then 2 a.m. again, those start forming. That is a rhythm. So see here, in our study, we observed increased activity of hemostasis clotting process in the morning, which is characterized by increased platelet aggregation, fibrinogen and PAI concentration, which is accompanied by increase in thrombin generation markers. We also observed fibrinolysis. So now after the clot is made, then we start breaking the clot during the day. Fibrinolysis system activation progression from the morning to the afternoon characteristic by increase in the concentration of TPA and D-dimers. Beautiful, beautiful paper. Dalla, thank you very much for showing it to us. And back to you. I actually want to want to thank one person very special for this. This is Dr. Albin Sigamani, the pharmacologist, the MD pharmacology, who is the head of clinical research of one of the big hospital systems. He's been an absolute ally of mine uh, all through the year and a half of treating COVID. I do have a nephrologist classmate and a cardiologist classmate also who have been very close to me. But Albin has really helped me with the science side of things. I'm not a scientist. I'm a physician. I'm a clinician. But I do need to know the science to be able to work this because I see a lot of things that I can go back and say, what's happening here? Why am I seeing this? And that's how they give me the answers. And I can continue treating the way I treat because of the support I get. Okay, let's talk about why do patients clot at night? We've seen the paper, great paper, and that was a great paper to go through, which kind of got me thinking on, on this lines. So some of the possible reasons are, we observed that more there are more pro-thrombitic -thromb cells circulating the blood at night compared to the fibronolytic elements during the day. So that was what was said. So keeping a person awake at night when they are having a pro-thrombotic state will help. Because I always say, what do we see and what can we do? That's the way I work, okay? During the second point, during the day, we produce higher cortisol levels. So corticosteroids in our blood. And this decreases the influence of inflammatory markers on causing thrombosis and collateral damage. At night, since there's less cortisol, uh, the thrombosis can occur faster. And in COVID, that's very, very true. Next slide, please. Yeah, I want to, uh, Daryl, if you give me just one quick second, my uh, sure. apologies for the interruption. I saw a comment talking about the taking blood thinners or going to the doctors. The paper that I just showed, that is for healthy people. This is a normal behavior. That does not need blood thinners. That, that does not need management. That is a normal behavior of our body. However, when a disease is superimposed, as Daryl is going to talk about, then there is an issue and then doctors come in and blood thinners come in. So my point is, please don't start taking blood thinners thinking this is something abnormal. This is normal. It happens to everyone and we live normally with that. Back to you, Darren. And that's why it's called the normal circadian rhythm. What happens in the normal circadian, the daytime is like this and nighttime is like this. So that's the whole reason why we're bringing up this is normal. In COVID, it's abnormal. So that's why we have to relate the normal to abnormal and treat that. Okay. The, the, the third point I want to highlight here is that there is a drop in oxygen saturation during the night, especially when we sleep. And this level of drop can, of course, it changes with age, underlying, underlying respiratory disease and other factors. 
even in normal people, it's known to drop by 10% from baseline. So if your baseline is 96, 97, 98, you can go down to 89. Many times I've seen COVID patients, I'm really serious about this, COVID patients at 95, 96, wake up in the morning at 88 and there's panic. So I try to solve that problem. So again, so, so, so let's talk about point four. There's increased bronchoconstriction that may occur at night. So in many patients, a drop in oxygen saturation between, between 10 a.m. And 11, and, and 11 p.m. and then 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. So when you take that measurement, the, S, the oxygen saturation ratio, SpO2 level, at say, at say 11 p.m., and then you see an amount at, at 6 a.m., that's, that's a typo that should have been uh, 10, 10, 11, 10 p.m. and 11 p.m., and then 6 a.m., 7 a.m. If you see that difference, there may be a big drop and that drop can make people really paranoid. So to avoid that, I ended up giving, giving uh, bronchodilators and kind of overcame that side of it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so clotting in the lungs occurs in acute COVID disease during day eight to day 10. We all know COVID is a 10 day, 14 day disease. Week one leads up to the tsunami the tsunami sets off a damage, that damage is clotting. Clotting really occurs between day 8 to day 10. And after day 11, if you haven't had clotting, you're pretty much on the road to recovery. Okay. However, we could see this happen even late, late evening on, on this day 7. And it could prolong itself to day 11. So that's something I want you guys to be, be careful of. So, so next slide, please. So how does one keep a patient awake at night. One rule I have, when you have COVID, if your oximeter readings are unstable, they are bouncing up and down. They're going from 95, 96 down to 92, 93. I want you to stay awake that night. Whether it's night seven, night eight, night nine, night 10, you're gonna stay awake. You'll sleep during the day, you'll sleep, you'll stay awake at night. I've, I think I, with this, practice or this protocol, I've, a lot of lives have been saved. And I wish to God I had brought this up much earlier to the world. So a lot more could have been saved. So walking around the room or the home uh, would be very, very important to, 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 to keep people awake. Doing proning exercises. We talked about proning on one of my videos. So proning exercise, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, every hour sitting and watching TV or reading. Keep that patient alive. Keep that patient awake. If you keep him, he or she awake, they will be alive. Let the patient sleep in the morning, the afternoon and evening, even if for three hours at a time, two hours at a time, let them sleep. Nighttime, no sleep. So usually when you sleep, I want patients sleeping on their belly or their stomach or on their sides. No sleeping on the back. Because if you sleep on your back, even in the daytime, the st st stasis of blood in the back of the lungs can accentuate or accelerate clotting. So that's that's one of the things we need to watch out for. Uh, yeah. Then the ideal thing is to get a buddy, a wife, husband, son, mother, daughter, father, somebody of a family member, or a friend, or a nurse to help with this process for those four days. I normally, if the family can't do it, I just ask them to hire a nurse, put a nurse there, and make sure the nurse and the, the patient do not sleep the night. And I'm very, very strict on this in my protocol. Next slide, please. Got it. Thank you very much. And just a very quick um, uh, disclaimer here. These discussions are good informational things for patients and informational for healthcare workers. They have to figure it out what is the right thing for the patient. So this is not a medical advice, just the experience from Dr. DeMello for how he has been managing his patients. And if somebody can take some useful value from this, that is the, the best thing. So I, I, I'm wondering whether we should bring in Aaron now. We have a patient who's actually who's actually gone through this not sleeping at night. Or should I just go through and talk about the monitoring and all that stuff, uh, Dr. Mobian? We can have Aaron with us. Let's bring Aaron in, yeah. OK, so uh, Cool Beans, we have a patient. His name is Aaron. Aaron, welcome. and. Uh, Please tell us about your experience. Daryl, over to you and Aaron. Yeah, sure. Aaron, share, uh, with, so share, with, share with the world 
your experience what happens uh and you had no medicine we we couldn't i mean you couldn't get medic medication all we did was the physical exercise and all that stuff so just share with Correct. the world how you went through the process yeah, basically nobody would give me an oxyparin or a rivaroxaban to prevent clotting, so I had to take manually anticoagulate myself. So basically what happened is that I really keyed in on my um, oximetry readings, and I noticed that when clotting occurs, your SpO2 remains consistent, but your heart rate ramps up really rapidly. So that was a key to me um, versus like a cytokine wave, which is the exact opposite. Your SpO2 falls while your heart rate remains consistent. So for me, I really had to take and really just maintain the oximeter on my finger, keep an eye on, on my heart rate. As soon as it elevated, I had to get up and walk. I stayed up all night for probably four nights in a row, walked uh, continuously, and then I would sit back down. And if my heart rate would drop, then I, could, I knew it was over. That, that section of clotting or that section of time of high risk of clotting was, had ended. If it didn't drop, and it stayed elevated, I got right back up again and walked. And I did this for probably four to six hours every night. And I just wasn't able to sleep. So um, I really believe that that was what helped me save my lungs and preserve them and prevent a lot of uh, downstream effect and, and other problems. But those were really key elements of, in oximetry readings. It kept you out of hospital. You know, we Absolutely. had no, I had you no, had no oxygen. Yeah. I had no supplemental oxygen. I had no dexamethasone, no steroid use, um, and I had no hospitalization. They wouldn't even admit me because my O2 sats were probably around 95, 96 at the time. And, they, and as you said, they tended to drop, and you see this fall into the high 80s, and you just can't panic. You have to just get up. And, and try to manually walk around and get those levels back up to where they needed to be. And normally they would recover. So that was a really important thing is that um, they would recover into the mid to low 90s, even during this clotting phase and the cytokine waves. And the difference is, like I said, with the cytokine waves versus the clotting is that, first of all, like I said, the O2 sats... Uh, change and the heart rate remains the same. But then also, if you really key in on your body, even with anosmia, you can still smell the cytokines in your nasal mucosa. And if you recognize those smells, then you know what's happening. And that preceded the waves that, that came upon me. And so it's really, it's kind of weird, but I've always had this ability to smell this scent in my nose whenever I got sick way before COVID. I mean, this is like decades ago. And nobody could ever tell me what those smells were. Well, there there could be interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, could be TNF-alpha, these cytokines that are released that cause hyperinflammation. And so I recognized that, and I knew that I needed to get up, move around, not for clotting, but just to keep and maintain elevated O2 sats. Very interesting. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much. Such a delight to have worked with you on that. Um, you know, your night was my day. So it was really <laughs> kind of a, it, we worked together so nicely just on the, just on the exercise part of it and staying awake. I mean, boy, you, you, you are such a different person today. What was your last SPO2 number you showed me? No, it was 99% with a heart rate. Yeah, 99% with a heart rate of like 75 beats per minute. So... so. Very he's good. he's out, out of danger, 100%. Yeah. No, this is a demo. I mean, this is really a live patient, a patient who a week ago was so bad that I told him, go get admitted. And he, go get admitted. Oh. Go get admitted. And today, just by doing the exercise and staying awake at night, it's made a massive difference with, to him. Okay. Excellent. So once again, thank you, Aaron. Congratulations that you are doing well. Um, unfortunately, many of us are not that lucky and uh, hoping these things can be valuable for them as well. Thank you for sharing your experience. Absolutely. Aaron, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Okay. Take care, buddy. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. So back to you, Daryl. Let's go, go to the slide to you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, some of the things that I put in in my protocol is monitoring of O2 levels, oxygen saturation levels. I want an 8 a.m., 2 p.m., 10 p.m. every day for 14 days. 
uh, get a reading from the index finger and a temperature testing. So I want to know what the temperature is. Patient is advised to do a six minute walk in the room, then check pulse oximeter at 8 a.m., 2 p.m., and 10 p.m. This has been my protocol from May of last year, not new. Any reading above 95 is normal, no damage to lung, nothing to worry. Next page, please. Dr. Mobin, yeah. Here are the numbers, 95 to 100 is ideal, 90 to 94 is concerning, 85 to 89 is very, very concerning. 84 and below, I usually ask people to get admitted. I've now changed that to maybe below 80, I'll admit, but I try and kind of bring them back. Now, if I can't get a bed and there's any delay, then I got to work faster. So I do a lot more things than I've shared a lot of the stuff in Oxyparin uh, with the with the Cool Bean group. I've shared all of the, the medication side of things in my earlier, earlier discussions. Next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about diet and nutrition. So I have, again, a very strict diet. I follow a plant-based di uh, diet. No red meat, no pork, no, preferably no meats, at least for the 14 days of acute COVID that we have. I recommend soft food only, lentils and rice. Boiled lentils and rice is probably the best. In, in, in India, it's called dal kichdi. Then we have juices, any kind of juice, carrots, beetroots, any kind of soups, yellow pumpkin soup, veggie soups, you can have eggs. That's the only thing I really allow patients to have is eggs. Uh, tender coconut water, protein powder and milk or water. Lots of yogurt because I want your probiotics to be replenished or increase the probiotics because when you have COVID, you're going to have a, a constitutional COVID. You're going to have, uh, you know, your stomach, your intestines are going to be upset. You're going to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fullness. So I want all the gas issues taken care of by probiotics. And there's a rule I follow, no alcohol for, for one month, not even cough syrup containing alcohol. So whenever people ask me, can I have the cough syrup, sir? No, you cannot. I'm very strict. If you want, want anything, I'll give you a, a butter side inhaler or something else, but no alcohol for, for a whole month. Here's why. The COVID inflammation, already has caused the liver to get inflamed. The liver enzymes are high. You add alcohol to that, you're gonna double the damage. I don't need that. I don't need your liver to start failing while we are trying to get you back from COVID. So there are certain reasons for why I say certain things. Next slide, please. Okay, the last thing, which is the most important, and Aaron didn't mention this, he drank a lot of fluids. I want my patients to drink a lot of fluids and a lot of electrolytes. I keep hearing, oh, sir, my blood pressure is dropping to 50 diastolic. My heart rate has come down to 40. Please take some fluids. Please take some electrolytes. You'll get better. Give it a, a six hours. Give it 12 hours. Give it 24 hours. You get better. So we follow the American Nephrology Association uh, guidelines. Females have to have at least three and a half liters of water, water, electrolytes, or oral rehydration solutions. Men have to go to four to four and a half liters of water or electrolytes. Okay, so please follow that. That will also save your life. It will also, so anybody with a 1.6 liter or two liter intake is going to have a problem. You're going to have low, low heart rates. You're going to have, you know, uh, bradycardia and you're going to have uh, hypotension because of hypovolemia and uh, hyponatremia. So I, I want people to really maintain their fluid intakes up up and above the normal things so that we can go, you know, we can get better. So it's a tidying over those four or five days. You wait for the first four, five, seven days, you wait for the hurricane or the tsunami to hit you. When it hits you, you got to be prepared to take care of it. And after that is a cruise control after that. So if you come through those four days, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, ten is usually eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen is screw control. And then, of course, I make sure people don't overdo themselves day fifteen to day thirtieth before we do any major. Mobile. Got it. Thank you so much. So, uh, importance of walking, staying alert during the critical times. Importance of the food as well. Uh, I think that this is a great part of the discussion. How about, would you have time to take some questions as well? Absolutely.
Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, Cool Beans, let's have some questions answered as well. My request to you is rhetorical questions that um, why not take a vaccine or why take a vaccine or where is ivermectin or uh, let's have a discussion in the context of the topic today. And that is that when somebody is going through the acute phase, what are the good things to do in terms of their daily routine, what foods or related uh, topics. Is that good, uh, Daryl, for you as well? Absolutely. Super. Let's do that. Excellent. So let's start. I'm going to see here. There is a question by Rizzo Bits. She says, I have post EBV inflammation, chronic fatigue, exercise induced pain and weakness. When I move around it, it makes my legs hurt more. Any advice? So again, uh, there is no personal medical advice. There can be more mechanisms and theoretical uh, possibilities that we can discuss. Yes, please. Okay. Is, I mean, if this is pre-COVID or post-COVID, I don't know, but I'm guessing this is post-COVID uh, or just because you had EBV inflammation, chronic fatigue. You need to fix that. Uh, you can fix that in many ways. Uh, you can take anti-inflammatory drugs. You can you can improve your electrolytes. This is this is not really nothing to do with COVID for now. If it's a post-COVID issue, we can talk much about it, but. You really need to focus on your on your anti-inflammation and and get your body back to normal, even though you have fatigue. It, it's doable. And I'm happy to talk to you offline, but I think online I want to stay stay on topic today. Got it. Thank you very much. Buzz Night Gear says, Hi doctors, why would you take extra melatonin if it makes you sleepy at night sleep at night and it's best to be awake? So I don't recommend I melatonin. Yeah, you can take it. I'm going to just say my my protocol is very very simple. I have I have just a few drugs, a very simplified protocol I use, and I've used it for a year and a half plus and more. So very successfully used. I do not give many things that other doctors give. So let's stay with 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 you know. I, melatonin is, is not in my protocol, but Dr. Dr. Bean, you want to go with it? Yeah, so uh, number one, this is important that because this discussion is for the topics related to Dr. DeMello's protocol, so he does not use melatonin. So that means that does not counter the advice he gives to his patients. Uh, in addition to that, melatonin's role, I have discussed that in the past as well. It has an, a very important anti-inflammatory role, especially the reactivation of mitochondrial stoppage that happens because of COVID and many other diseases that cause inflammation. So bringing mitochondria back to sort of life or back to activate activation status, that is where melatonin is useful. And for the medicos here, what melatonin does is there are Cori cycle and Krebs cycle related, some of the enzymes in ATP production inside the mitochondria that get phosphorylated incorrectly in the presence of uh, pro-inflammatory stresses in the cell, especially for the viruses. And the mitochondria reduces production of ATP. Melatonin can reverse that phosphorylation and that is how it restores ATP production, which is important. Plus, once the ATP production starts, cells pro-inflammatory state goes down as well and cells become balanced. So I think one has to balance it out that if somebody is in that state, how do you keep somebody alert as well? Maybe melatonin, use it at a different time or reduce the dose. Okay, so continuing on, this is a great discussion. I love it. Uh, There's a very interesting Aaron question. Aaron has for, a comment. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah Aaron, Aaron has a comment. He wants to comment on the hydration issue. If you can bring him in, that'll be great, Dr. Mobin. Yeah, we'll take is, Joyce. Is for yes, Aaron, Aaron. As well from Joyce. Yeah, please, Aaron, go ahead. Aaron, we cannot hear you. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead. Okay, sorry about, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the hydration issue cannot be stressed enough. This is absolutely essential. For example, if um, I had one bout of diarrhea and Imodium AD helped you know, uh, solve that problem, but it took me six hours of hydrating overnight. I had to stay up all night again just to hydrate myself to get to get to baseline after one bout. It's really, it's really difficult to stay on top of this situation, but it's absolutely essential because 
everything keys off of hydration. And if you really allow yourself to be dehydrated and you don't have a banana bag, you know, sitting in a hospital bed, then you have to do it yourself. And it's not just, you just simply can't take and just down a gallon of water in, you know, half an hour and be done with it. it your, your body is in the hyperinflammation state won't allow that to happen. So it's really, you just have to take sips of water continuously. After, and it took me six hours of doing this to get out of this dehydrated state from one instance. So it's really, I cannot stress the significance of remaining hydrated. Got it. And, and in this much. case, in this case, uh, Mobin, in this case, uh, I want to highlight one more point here on diet. This is COVID inflammation uh, induced diet, nothing to do with medications. Uh, COVID inflammation causes the nerve, nerve, nerve system to lose control of the gut and for the gut to misfire. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea are pretty common. I get the question all the time from patients, sir, is it due to the drugs? And the answer is no. There's nothing connected connect with the drugs. Take, take the lopramide or take your Imodium and control it from one side, but also rehydrate yourself. So Aaron's sharing a very good point he's making about the hydration issue. Aaron, thank you once again. Yep. Aaron, thank you very much. And there is a question about Aaron from Joy Fisher. Please review Aaron's pulse rate versus oxygen level for movement. Okay. So, um, like I said, there are two instances uh, that drove changes in SpO2 and heart rate, and that was clotting versus cytokine waves. So, I'm not sure if she's asking about... The, I can talk about both instances, but like I already said, is that they... The, your oximetry readings will react differently based upon if you're experiencing clotting versus a cytokine storm. So, um, regardless of what you, of what, uh, what, which one, which one it is, you still got to. It's still preferable to get up and move around and try to increase those and practice deep breathing, of course. Um, but try to get those O2 sats back up to where they need to be uh, as best as possible. Got it. Thank you very much, Aaron. Aaron, I'm going to uh, move you to the backstage once more, and we'll continue with the discussion. Thank, Thank you, you Aaron. very much. Uh, so there's a question from Doug Haas. How about bone broth with lentils? When cool enough to drink uh, that's soup. Like vinegar soup. with mother. That's soup. That's easily the digestible liquid that you can have with lentils. So it's, it, uh, I don't know about the cider vinegar, but again, you can have the broth with lentils. So and I try and stay away with anything broth. that can. What's that? I love broth. I love, we call it yakni. I love it. Right. Okay, excellent. So that is that question. Uh, next question. This is an interesting question. Melamorph says, can Aaron walk through his protocol day one to resolution? I I think we'll 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 uh, unless you want Aaron to talk talk about it. Aaron, you want to talk about your protocol from day one to day to resolution? Yeah, well, my situation is very unique because I knew I was infected before I had any symptoms. Look, our daughter brought this home from high school. And so as soon as she presented with fever, I knew we had a 100% attack rate in the home. So, I, I mean, I can tell you what I did personally. I don't know if you want me to comment on it. But, I mean, I was in the very unique situation of, of beginning ivermectin four and a half days before symptoms even showed up on me. But, in fact, it didn't actually... It, it may have helped some degree, but it did not prevent me from precipitating into a very bad COVID, severe COVID state. So I think it's important for people to understand that, uh, and I don't, know, I don't know if you guys want to talk about ivermectin, but look, it's, it, for Delta, it is, in my opinion, it's not the miracle drug anymore. So as far as, as far as what kept me out of hospital, kept me off of steroids and, and off of supplemental oxygen, it was colchicine. Colchicine is the miracle drug here. And that, that is the bottom line. And it's a real shame that people don't understand how to treat this disease. And they're throwing 20 to 30 different meds at this problem instead of actually treating it early in this, in, when you can actually get a handle on it with the correct medication. So that's really as simple as it gets. I didn't have access to anoxaparin. I didn't have access to supplemental oxygen. I didn't have access to dexamethasone. Those were an options for me. But in fact, because the colchicine works so well, I didn't actually need any of that. So it really is a testament to 
properly identifying the meds and the, and the therapeutics that are, are most applicable to solve this, you know, problem. And that, and your, your channel has done that in multiple situations already. So we don't need to talk about it. And I want to add you. this, please, please make sure you talk with your doctor. That is the right place to do whatever are your thoughts for your management. Please discuss them with your doctor, do it with their guidance and under their observation. Please do not uh, medicate yourself by yourself. That can be very dangerous. And if I can comment on that, um, colchicine is, you know, in my, uh, the way I look at it is there are 963 drug to drug interactions and I have looked at every single one of them. Um, so people can get themselves into big, big trouble if they don't understand what they're doing with this drug. And if they continue to take other meds at the same time, bad, bad things can happen. So it's really important not to self-medicate and you really have to understand what this drug is capable of doing. Having said that, it's a wickedly powerful drug for COVID. Excellent. Thank so, you, Aaron, Thank you, Thank you Aaron. very much. Thank you more. And I'm going to bring you to backstage. Continuing with the questions, uh, let's see. There's a question from Robin. Is indomethacin interchangeable with colchicin? No. My answer is no. Not, not, definitely not, for, not interchangeable with colchicin. Very different mechanical actions. Uh, great, I mean, colchicine is a great product for COVID. Endomethacin has different roles for other things. Okay. Zan Solo says, Dr. DeMello, what is your opinion about black seeds as prevention and treatment for COVID? I, I, I really, I'm not qualified to comment on it, but I've not used black seeds. So it, for me, it's, it's like, you know, I'm not going to say something that I can, I can stop, I can help support or not support. I, I don't have the experience with it. Got it. Uh, Doug says, did Aaron take ivermectin for this or another COVID-19 illness? Yeah, he just uh, mentioned he took it for five days straight. He took it for five days straight and it didn't stop him from going into the into the clotting phase. And that's where he connected with me on a different role. He had Colchison. He, he, his option was go to ER, they send him back. Go to ER, they send him back. Twice they did it. And then his option was, they're not admitting me. They're not doing anything with me. What do I do? So you exercise. You're on the right medication. Now just exercise. Now just stay awake. Just don't sleep the night. And various, this was a cl classical example of just using the resources you have, which is very limited, and hydrate yourself. Very limited resources, which is the person just being able to follow instruction to the T. And he did that beautifully. And you can see the result for that. Excellent. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on the Twitter as well. So there's a question there that says, number one, there is a comment by Kim, love Dr. DeMello. So I think we all do that. So thank you. Uh, there is a question here. I don't know if you want to take this question. The question is by Keywine. Can we prevent formation of autoantibodies mm -hmm. in COVID? or vaccines uh what was the question i, I didn't hear that moment so the question is can we prevent production of formation of autoantibodies so autoimmune reaction because of covid or vaccine can that be prevented uh, i i i'll just say one thing and I'm, I'm, i i don't know about the autoantibodies but you know what we try to do with with the treatment of covid is to reduce any unto, untoward effects with with a drug like colchicine or anything else. So it's used very very carefully, very select selectly, and in the right way. Uh, autoantibodies is something that your body will create to fight itself, and there has to be something really bad with your body to make it happen. So I'm trying out. I've actually come up with a vaccine prophylaxis. And that seems to be working pretty well so far for me and for people who take the vaccine. But I don't have large numbers to be able to say, hey, in 5,000 cases, it'll work this way or that way or whatever it is. But the, little, the few cases I've done, we've handled it, it's worked pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Richard Moy says, for Dr. DeMello, it has been almost two weeks since the ICMR pulled its ivermectin authorization from on the ground. How much impact has this had? 
on medical practice in Delhi and India. How important do you expect this will be? Why did it happen? Uh, the last question, I do not know why, and that's not my role to comment. How important do you expect this to be? I expect it to be of zero value to anybody in India. We are all using ivermectin. Pretty Every patient of mine who comes with acute COVID gets ivermectin uh, for two days, two doses a day for two, two days per my protocol. Family members get uh, one dose a day to, for two days a period. I, I follow a certain protocol for family members also. Uh, how much impact? This impact, there'll be almost negligible to zero impact on medical practice. I don't know about Delhi, but I think about across India, we are all using the drugs we, that we know work and, and it continues to work. Besides, the cases have come down, so it's not, it's not going to make that much of an impact. Yeah. Got it. Lex says, new drug tested Sweden April 1, a new experimental antiviral drug project, Monuvipiravir. We talked about it yesterday. Against COVID-19 will be tested in Sweden in the weeks after Easter. This is a means that was initially intended against influenza, but which now seems to be effective also against COVID-19. This seems like a comment and not a question. So uh, back here, uh, let's see if there are more questions on the YouTube and Facebook side. And for the Facebook, one of the Facebook channels is not connecting, and that is, I do not know it is a Facebook issue or my streaming software's issue, but there is an issue there. Okay, so let's see. So John C. says, is there a COVID protocol available for reference in Dr. DeMello? Is there what? Uh do they do we have access to your protocol in writing somewhere uh my protocol was up on one of the websites uh exx exstnc and i i don't know if it's still there or not there but if you want a protocol my protocol is pretty simple it's on the videos we the interview videos we did with dr bobin and it's all there everything is public now there's nothing hidden okay so right, if you, you want, much. if you really want to, you can come to me uh, offline and, you know, through my website or through Dr. Bean, you can come to me. We'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a response for that. Okay. Excellent. Thank uh, you very much. Question is the, this spicy? Sorry. So this cool beans. Thank you very much for staying on point with the today's topic. So spicy curry meal. Okay. Or should be bland? Uh, no, no spice, please. Uh, I prefer bland meals. Here's why. Your intestines, your GI tract is frozen or, or gone into, uh, it, it's not mobile, it's not functioning properly. So you do not want anything to make it worse. Your whole, the whole you, because of your s uh, central nervous system aspect, inflammation side, you're going to have problems. So let's not, let's not do, give, eat food that will irritate us even more. So we want to be bland, we want to be soft, we want to be yogurt uh, based, we want to be really low salt if possible. So again, there's a lot of things about, uh, there's a lot of thought process I put into why my, my, my whole protocol works the way it works from the diet side, from the exercise side and from the drug side. Okay, I hope that helps. Yeah. Got it, thank you. And I'm just looking for, there is an interesting question, Snap says, uh, dear doctors, does the new concept of functional medicine agree with your protocol that predict outcomes of a COVID-19 infection? I have no comment on functional medicine. I just do not know enough. I do not know enough about functional medicine, but I tell you, my protocols for COVID-19 seem to be very successful. And I've been very, very happy with the way it's panned out or come out. Uh, it, the four, four months of hard work I put in January, February, March, April of 2020 paid off when I started practicing and started treating COVID patients. I did, took the first 200 cases to trial out different things and zeroed in on dosages and I stayed with it. And it's been just, just slam. Everything has worked really well. I can't complain about it. Got it. So this is an interesting comment. Dr. DeMello looking great. Let's see you without mustache to compliment the new young look. 
So, well, what would you take? <laughs> I probably shaved my mustache four times in my life. <laughs> so, thank you, so Victoria. Is it a fifth time now? I don't know. So we may have a fifth time. Who knows? <laughs> would you shave it once the pandemic is over? Uh, possibly. Okay. What is? Okay. Uh, so again, we cannot offer individual personalized advice here. Please don't ask those questions. It is difficult. It is unethical. It is unprofessional. So uh, don't put me and Dr. DeMello in that state. Um, hypothetical questions, theories, mechanisms, uh, protocol discussions, educational discussions are, are fine. Okay, so let's see. I, I just want to make a point here. I do not dismiss anything that I'm not familiar with. I openly say I'm not familiar with something. I'm not going to comment on it. Okay. So. Got it. Yeah. This is a very interesting question. Nawab Abdul says, serious skin rashes. Is COVID stress the cause? Or can COVID cause skin rashes? Uh, COVID, skin manifestation of COVID is pretty common. Skin rashes are part of it. It's not drug related. I, I, I see that almost, I won't say daily now, but at least a weekly, I will have a patient who has skin rashes or has skin issues. They'll have big blotches of red, red blotches on their legs or hands. They'll have irritations. Uh, I mean, you can see so many different ways of uh, skin manifestation. That's been one of the more common symptoms in lesser percentage of patients, but I've seen that probably every week, at least in one patient. So it's kind of an interesting observation that and a comment that the person made, Abdul made, you know. Right. Uh, Adeline has been repeating this question that what is culture scene? We have done this discussion many, many times about culture scene, its mechanism of action, its uh, usage. So I would recommend that please watch some of the previous videos. Uh, I'm going to continue here. Uh, let's see. There are some vaccine related questions. Uh, Rose Rooney, you had a question on my vaccine prophylaxis. I, uh, come to me through my website. It's, it is daryldemello.in. You come to me through that. We will we will give you we'll provide it to you, and then it's up to you to work with your local doctor to make it happen. Okay. Excellent. So it, le it looks like we have a. So there is a question. Let's make this as our last question for today. Valerie Road says, has Dr. DeMello seen any evidence of ADE with his own patient population or his own observation of it? Not yet. I did have a patient who had a clot in the brain post-vaccine, and that's why I was driven to come up with a vaccine prophylaxis. The way I, re I work is many times you take something at face value till you hit a bump. Then you look at, oh, what are the issues? With the vaccine, I took everything at face value. And then when I hit the bump, I said, okay, here's the issue I'm going to have. Let's try and prevent it. So that's why I came up with the vaccine prophylaxis. So, yeah. Right. And generally, ADE is not something that is observable. I know that there are some doctors who have been tweeting that I saw this evidence and this is an indication of ADE. There is very difficult... Uh, it is impossible to observe someone and say this person has AD. Uh, Mike Ridgeway says, Dr. DeMello, can you please let viewers know about your Facebook group, COVID Early Treatments group? Don't wait. Yeah, we do have a group on Facebook. It's a, a currently a closed group. I, I restrict the entry to people who are, you know, who really need to be helped. Uh, I do not offer advice there. I'll guide you and, and, and suggest certain things. And usually on, on Facebook or any social media, I will not post specific treatment. But in general, we can talk. If you need something specific, come offline. We'll handle it from there. So yes, there's a group. And Mike is a very good friend of mine. And he does a great job in, in managing that whole process. Mike, thank you. Excellent. So your t-shirt is liked by Cool Beans. Okay, so uh, Dr. Demelo, Daryl, any comments before we close for today? Uh, you know what? I I think we are seeing seeing the beginning of the end of COVID, and I think that's the best news I'm going to say here. I'm beginning to see the, whether it takes six months or a year more. I don't know, 
but i think given what we have seen the last uh, since since may i th- i think i think i'm being i'm being cautious about what i say but i'm i'm pretty excited that i'm beginning to see the end of covid and i don't think covid is going to be a real long term problem i think it's going to be a pretty good uh, you know you'll have pretty good immunity and you know as we go along whether it'll be a once in five year disease or whether it'll be who knows but i think we're done with covid so hang in there guys if you can just hang in there and not not get covid you know you get covid the right way and uh, just follow covid appropriate behavior i think in the next 4 5 months you'll be out of covid most of us will be out of covid so you know that's 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 the message i have excellent Aaron, thank you karan any comments from you and then we say thank you from all of us karan you are muted sorry sorry about that following up a little bit about the, the dietary situation you know i lost about 15 pounds through this through this disease and um you just can't eat so you have to i really recommend people listen to dr demello about the meat situation because that will really cause a big problems in your git um and so it really needs to be uh easily digested um if you even are able to eat but once you get past the hyperinflammatory state then your appetite tends to come back a little bit you may have some residual loose bowel movements but those go away over time as well and then your full uh your full um appetite returns and so that's how you're able to get through but you don't want to take and exacerbate any kind of of the inflammatory situation through the intestines like you said got it so aaron thank you very much would be so thank you very much for your time thank you from me mobeen thank you from daryl thank you from aaron and thank you to daryl and aaron for being here and sharing your experience and your knowledge thank you very much and bye bye for now we will not have a discussion this evening because this is the talk for today i would see you all again tomorrow at 6 pm bye bye thank you guys wherever you are namaste and have a great day have a good evening wherever you are and good luck to you covid should be done with bye bye